thank you, everybody. I'm going to pour myself some water because it is more civilized to drink from a cup than from a bottle. So here we go. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, but the past few speaking engagements I've had, oh, that's a beauty. Past few speaking engagements I've had, I've had a couple of glasses of wine before going up to speak. I don't know why I've gotten into this habit, and it might not seem like much worth commenting on until you remember that I have the alcohol tolerance level of a 90-year-old woman. <laughs> so you never really know what I'm going to do. You know, it makes it sort of interesting for me. Like I can sort of sit back and say, let's see what I say up there. That'll keep, keep, keep me on my own toes. But uh, apparently people don't drink at IU, so... Um, wasn't able to snag any wine, so I'm actually a little concerned. I'm not sure I can do this sober anymore. I don't know. We're just gonna we're gonna find out. Um, I am very glad to be here. I haven't got much else to say about the the situation other than I, that I'm very glad that people were able to to join us. I have to be sort of discriminating when I choose where I go and and. Uh, which invitations I can accept. I would like to accept many more invitations than I, I do, uh, and I would if I were just a bachelor, but I'm actually happily married for eight years with four little children, the oldest of whom is seven, and all of whom are girls. And every, <laughs> people think that's funny. <laughs> oh, it is. I don't know if funny is quite the word, however, but. But they're so, they're so wonderful, and I, I don't want them to grow up thinking, well, you know, we never saw our father. And he was never around. So I don't want to be one of those. So I've got a strict sort of number of days that I can be out of town every month, and I was very glad to be able to do this. In particular, I do want to say a little something about my eldest. And I know how tiresome it is. You know, you hear people tell stories about their kids, and you roll your eyes like, oh, yeah, another kid's story. Great, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, you met one kid, you met them all, some of the men sort of think, right? But it's not so, okay? They all have their own individual personalities. And my eldest, and I, again, I'm always sad to have to leave them, but my eldest, Regina, some of you have heard this story, but I can't resist telling it to you, was uh, talking to a friend of hers not too long ago, also seven years old. And this friend of hers reads a lot of old-timey 19th century stories. And one of these stories that she had read was talking about some things you could buy with a penny. And of course, even up in through the 20th century, we heard about the phenomenon of penny candy. And so in this 19th century story, this person was going on and on about all the things that could be purchased with a penny. And this girl asked my daughter, well, uh, Regina, what do you think of this story? It seems kind of silly to me. I mean, everybody knows a penny buys hardly anything. And can you believe my daughter responded, yeah, thanks to the Fed. <laughs> Now, why do I bring that story up? Well, if you're thinking to yourself, man, whoever's educating this kid, I really want to pitch in and help push this process along because it's showing promising fruits already. There is a way you can contribute to the Woods Small Child Education Fund. And why, that's by buying a copy of one of my books on your way out, ladies and gentlemen. They're right there, and people would be glad to do that for you. All right, all right, that's terrible. That's terrible, but I have to say that. What I'm going to start off doing tonight is, first of all, talk, just saying what, what the free market is before we explain about the free market and the financial crisis. And then secondly, tonight, what I really want to focus on is primarily the phenomenon of business cycles, of why the economy seems to move the way it does. Like, how come we all seem to be doing well, and then we're all doing badly, and then we're all doing well, and then badly, and on and on and on. Like, why does it do that? Is that just written in the stars? Like, it has to be that way? Is that a fated existence? Or is there something causing this? And a lot of times people miss the forest for the trees because they want to focus in on the individuating characteristics of any particular bust phase of a boom-bust cycle. And they miss the commonalities. They miss the common features of the various cycles that we've been uh, subject to. So I'm going to focus in a lot on that particular question with, of course, application to our current situation. But I first want to start off with this, just talking about the free market because I think a lot of people don't even know what this is. Or they hear the term capitalism, which I take to be a synonym for free market, and their heads are just filled with all these sinister ideas and images. When they hear capitalism, they think of that guy on the monopoly box 
you know, a short guy with white hair, balding, with a little white mustache, you know, walking around carrying sacks of money with dollar signs on them. That's capitalism. And when you play that game, by the way, it doesn't really give capitalism a very good name. Like, what, what just because I land on you, I got to pay you money? What the heck kind of system is this? It's not exactly how the free market works, but nevertheless, it's some best-selling game and it has screwed up people's minds ever since on what capitalism is. But we've heard, and I, you know, I went through public school all my whole uh, education, and we all got the boogeyman definitions of capitalism and how terrible and wicked and oppressive it is, and everybody dies, and everybody winds up crawling around in the dirt, searching for worms to eat, and nobody has any food, and everybody's working in mines all day. Like, we, I know, I got that, you got that, we all know that's the standard version. We all know that. But what's the real definition of the free market? The real definition is very simple. Free market is a system of, pri of, 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 of free and voluntary exchanges bounded by private property rights. That's really all it is. It just means nobody's allowed to steal. You acquire property, and then you can exchange that property with other people through contract. Uh, you can give people gifts. As long as it's voluntary, as long as both parties consent to the transaction, then under the free market, it's a legitimate transaction. That's all it is. No coercion. No one side can force the other side to do anything against his will. No one can use physical compulsion. That's all it is. It turns out it's not a boogeyman thing after all. So this is what the free market is. Now in particular, I think it's worth focusing on what the free market makes possible, things that we don't really, I think, appreciate every day, precisely because they're so familiar to us. We see them every day, we don't think about them. We think they're just automatic. Like, we, like you walk down a, a supermarket aisle, the aisle is filled with things, right? Absolutely filled with stuff. And we don't even stop to pause at the miracle that's involved here. The transportation, the coordination, all the production processes, everything coming together at just the right time in just the right quantities. Nobody even stops to think about that. This has not been the case in every society. Obviously, the Eastern Bloc countries did not have this. You'd go to the supermarket and haggle over the one chicken leg that was still left, the chicken leg that's hobbling away while you're trying to grab it. This is, this is not a natural, naturally occurring phenomenon. It occur, there's a particular social system that makes it possible. So when I'm with my kids, we're going through the supermarket, I mean, they just can't stand me because I'm standing around trying to get them to appreciate how extraordinary it is that we're standing in this cornucopia of goodness. It's astonishing, right? Well, in particular, I just want to use as an example, an example I like very much that comes from a econ late economist named Murray Rothbard, who died 15 years ago. And Rothbard, who was a professor through his whole life and wrote an enormous amount, so much so that you think he must have been 10 people. Like anybody who's read Rothbard, say, how could one guy have done all the things this guy did? Before there was an internet, before you could use Wikipedia and pretend that you came up with all this stuff, I mean, he... <laughs> did this all as one individual. Well, we've got at the Mises Institute, M-I-S-E-S dot -E org, in our media file, where we've got all our audio and video files, we've got one of his courses that he taught when he was a professor, just Introduction to Microeconomics. And I love this because he was teaching engineering students. And these engineering students, they don't, even, they don't want to be taking economics. So he's got to think of some way to draw them in. How do I persuade them that this is not, in fact, a boring thing? This, by the way, I find this astonishing that people have been led to believe that economics is boring. That in itself, I think, is a devastating indictment of the economics profession. I mean, how large-scale social cooperation is possible without any central direction, without a dictator? Well, gee, that does seem kind of interesting. Or, you know, how all of us are getting screwed by various uh, aspects of the economy. I mean, you know, I find that kind of interesting, how I happen to be getting screwed. But we'll talk about getting screwed uh, later with the economy, you understand. And um, Rothbard starts off by saying this. Think of a simple thing. A simple thing, he says, like a ham sandwich. Now, we all know if you want a ham sandwich, you're going to have to get some ham and some bread and everything else that you want, lettuce, whatever else you're going to put on it. He says, now, let's just think just about the ham. Now, if you're going to sell ham sandwiches, okay, you're going to need some kind of place to sell them. So you've got some deli. The deli is going to require countertops, going to require tables and chairs, going to require refrigeration units. 
And each one of these things has a lengthy production process that, that uh, goes into it. So the chairs are going to be made out of steel, the steel, I mean, ultimately you have, you have a, a steel plant and the, the, the uh, uh, metals need to be mined and so on and on. It goes all the, all the way back and that's we haven't gotten to the food. But you think about the ham. So where does the ham, the ham doesn't just suddenly appear in the deli. You have to get the ham, you have to get the ham from some, some uh, uh, distributor who's going to get it from a meat packer, who's going to get it from a slaughterhouse, who's going to get it from a farmer, who's got to feed the pigs, so therefore he's got to grow corn to feed the pigs. He's getting all these different stages of production just to produce just the ham. Just all these different things are going into just this. And each stage, for example, you've got transportation, you've got to move the bring the ham from one place to another, so you've got to put it in trucks, the trucks need tires, the trucks need gasoline, the gasoline has a production process behind it, the tires have a production process behind it, and yet somehow, somehow, all these production processes take place and come together to produce ham for a ham sandwich in just the right quantities without any surpluses or shortages, and this happens day in and day out without any global, worldwide ham sandwich planning board overseeing the whole thing. And so th we should be amazed at this when we see a ham sandwich. Like, how did this happen? Think of all the different people whose activities had to come together in order to make possible this ham sandwich. In particular, when you think about it, no one of us, no one person actually has all the knowledge that was necessary to go into that particular sandwich. Because when you think about like the refrigeration that's required, do all of us have all the knowledge necessary to know all about how refrigeration units are constructed, are built? Uh, and if so, well then do you know a lot about mining? Uh, how much do you know about constructing a truck? Uh, how much do you know about making mustard? How much, I mean, well basically nobody would have all this knowledge in his head. And the beautiful thing about the decentralized order of the market is that nobody has to. We can all benefit from all the knowledge in everybody's head, and so working together we can produce something that nobody in isolation could produce, or certainly not with the same level of quality and efficiency. And again, this occurs spontaneously without any central direction. So what Rothbard says is, look, if you look at this phenomenon, this large-scale social cooperation that's necessary to produce even something as simple and basic as a ham sandwich, and you don't find that even slightly interesting, then yes, I guess economics will hold no interest for you at all. But if you are intrigued by this, yeah, you know what, come to think of it, how the heck does that happen? Then here you go, here's the, here's the course for you. Now secondly, about the market. A lot of people, I think, have misconceptions about the market in the sense that they believe that the free market is responsible for poverty and for low living standards. Because again, we all learned in eighth grade about people who had to work very long hours in the 19th century. And I'm not making light of that. These people, of course, did have to work very long hours in the 19th century. And only a madman would want to change places with a factory worker from 1825. Nobody disputes that. I'll get to in a minute why it is that people lived in those, those conditions. But right now, I think what people don't realize is precisely the progress that the world has made against poverty and largely uh, at a time when there's a complete absence of any government involvement in poverty. In fact, it seems like the, the progress has come to a screeching halt at that point. But in the 1820s, about then, if you look all over the world, you see that roughly 85% of the world was living in what economists sometimes call absolute poverty. By 1950, that was down to 50%. By 1980 or so, it was down to about one-third. In the developing world, from the period 1981 to 2001, poverty declined from about 40 to 21%, leading to an overall decline in the world from 33 to 18%. Not just the percentage, but the absolute number of people living in absolute poverty declined. That has never happened in any 20-year period in history. We have seen more progress in the struggle against poverty in the past 50 years than in the previous 500. 